Good morning. Thank you for joining our Home Builder webinar. We'll wait just a few minutes to let everyone join. Good morning, I'm John Pike, Executive Vice President and Director of Commercial Real Estate here at Vector Bank Colorado. I want to thank all of you for joining our first virtual home builder webinar. We typically call this our home builder breakfast, but for this time around, we've scheduled it later in the day to give everyone time to get their days started. Hopefully by this fall, we will be back in the office and be able to hold this home builder presentation in person. Participants are all muted and will only see the presenters for today. To change your view, look for the layout icon on the top right of your screen or your picture. You may need to click on your picture to, for this button to pop up. You can select the view that best suits your need at that point. On the bottom right, you will find the chat feature. Please select all panelists and send any questions you have at any time. We want this to be an interactive discussion throughout, just as if we were in person. Periodically, John Covert, We'll pause for questions and I will address the questions we have received at those uh, points. If we have a few minutes left at the end of the presentation, we can take more questions at that time. With that, I'd like to introduce John Covert to update us on the 2020 year end results and look forward to 2021. John, I'm going to turn it over to you at this point. Great. Thanks, John. Um, appreciate uh, you and the Vector team inviting me back uh, today. Even though the venue is a little bit differently, we're doing this uh, virtual. Uh, glad to be with all of you this morning. And I'll echo John's sentiment that it, it's our hope and our expectation that we start to have live events, start to reemerging uh, in our industry. Um, hopefully by this fall. So that's kind of what we're planning for. So hopefully I'll see you all face to face at some point this year. Uh, but we'll make do with uh, what we're doing today. Um, and um, we'll get started um, kind of diving into what we thought we would do is just do a little year in review, uh, 2020 in review. It was obviously a pretty challenging, but also dynamic year. Uh, for a lot of us in the industry. So there's a lot of exciting things to talk about, and there's some obvious unknowns and challenges in the year ahead that we want to address as well. So as, as John indicated, uh, I'll keep working through the presentation uh, and pause at a couple of points. And by the way, I'm looking up, I have a new kind of table set up here today, and I promise you I'm not watching a movie while I'm giving the presentation, but I'm looking off onto my uh, uh, 
uh, my separate of three screens now that I have on my desk. Uh, so I'm almost not, not ignoring you, but I'm looking off to the left here to my screen as well. Um, but I, I also want to mention that our uh, company here locally continues to expand. Uh, you can see on the bottom right, we've hired a, a couple of new uh, analysts, both Kapil and John. We're very excited about them uh, joining our team. Many of you on this call know our existing team. Uh, we're uh, really excited about Kapil and John. They come to us with a great uh, background in real estate um, in a bunch of different disciplines, not just home building. So they're really well-rounded analysts. Uh, but we're also sad to see one of our uh, longtime consultants move on to a different opportunity. Uh, Joe Hemelgarn, maybe many of you know him. He has been in this industry for decades, joined us almost five years ago, uh, but has decided to pursue another opportunity within the home building industry. Uh, so we're really sad to see him go. He's become a good friend of ours and mine personally, but also really excited about the opportunity he's got in front of him. But want to acknowledge uh, our team. Uh, we have a really talented, exceptional team uh, that I happen to stand on the shoulders of uh, that make me look good every day. So please reach out to any of us, not just myself, if you've got questions or needs, uh, whether you're a client of ours or not. And I think this is a good time to just briefly mention uh, that we are now known as Zonda. Many of you have known us as Metro Study for decades. I think Metro Study started in 1974 or 75 in Texas. So we've had a long run under that name, uh, but as our two companies were merged two years ago and under a new ownership structure, uh, it was always the anticipation that we would uh, forge ahead under one common brand name, and that name is now Zonda. So you'll see that in all of our collateral material, our uh, user enterprise systems uh, that you log into. Um, and, you know, that's that will uh, continue to um, morph in the year ahead. You'll see some additional changes uh, that we're all very excited about. Um, so just look for more news uh, that we'll send your way about our combined companies finally really coming together as one. It's, it's been a couple of year process for that to happen. So uh, as typically what I do with this group, we'll dive into kind of what's happening in the local economy before we get into the results of our um, housing survey and our data. <clears throat> so the first thing that I want to mention, um, and it, you know, it's, it's, before we dive into the economy and the home building industry, we have to address what's happening with the pandemic. I think nothing really can move forward with a whole lot of clarity until we get more clarity with what's happening on the health front with the pandemic. And we're all familiar with the, the dial that was revised at the end of last year to include the extreme risk, the purple aspect of the sundial. But I wanted to show you how our state has sort of been progressing the last few months where we actually, in November, you can see the top right, the December 5th um, illustration shows that a lot of the counties kind of slipped back into red um, as we got into the holiday months and the winter months, cases started to accelerate, hospitalizations really started to accelerate and thus deaths started to accelerate as well. Um, and then that kind of leveled off and we've, we've loosened some of those restrictions that were heightened and tightened um, around the holidays. And then uh, the January 29th one that you see on the bottom left-hand side of your screen, this is when they kind of revised the dial system to be a little bit more surgical or strategic with each county independently, uh, rather than some of the broad generalizations that the dial was applying and now uh, our trend is headed the other direction. Um, so some really good signs that restrictions are starting to be lifted. Cases are going down, hospitalizations are going down. And I know it, 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 we're all paying attention to this every day, <clears throat> but I think it's important uh, because it also translates into the general health of our economy as of this day. Um, and it's really difficult to project where this all goes, again, with out a little bit more clarity about where the pandemic is. So you can see on the on the left hand side of the screen here, the, the cases have been decelerating uh, really all through December when we hit that peak um, in late November. Uh, and then in 
into January and early February as well. And then the other thing that we're starting to track now is vaccinations. So if you go to the Colorado Department of Health and Environment, you can track what's happening with the daily deployment of the vaccinations. And so we broke it apart by county. So these two lines are moving in uh, their respective correct directions. Cases are going down and vaccinations are starting to accelerate really quickly. Um, so, you know, that's good. This will give us a little bit more clarity um, and hopefully by the summer months, uh, everybody that wants a vaccination has been vaccinated. Uh, there's more broad acceptance of vaccinations and we can start to unfold our economy a little bit as well as our social gatherings, which has been really challenging for all of us uh, without, you know, seeing extended family and friends and going to restaurants and all those things we love to do, sporting events, concerts, which we all miss and our presentations to uh, the industry. So uh, I'm gonna show you a few economic slides um, and then I'll pause. If there are questions, I'll reach out to John to see if there's any that were put in the chat room uh, that we can address before we get too far along past uh, these economic slides. Um, but the most recent numbers that we have are the preliminary numbers from uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics about um, what happened in terms of 2020 job growth numbers. So despite the fact that we started to gain some jobs back after the initial stages of the pandemic and all the job losses in, in uh, April and May, that you see the, the, the gray bars here that represent that sharp drop off that we had uh, in terms of layoffs, a staggering number. It's never happened that quickly. And of course, we're still grappling with that, but we're still at the end of uh, 2020, we're still 84,000 jobs fewer than we were in December of 2019, which ironically, it was when we hit our peak employment number at the end of 2019. Uh, so we've had a really long run, a decade long run of job creation that you know hasn't set records like we were in the late 90s, but it's been really steady job growth uh, in the Denver market roughly 40,000 jobs you can see on the third bullet point created every year on average for the previous 10 years. So that's a monthly job gain of about 3,600 jobs. <clears throat> so just doing a little back of the napkin math, if we were to actually get back to creating the same number of jobs, roughly 40,000 jobs a year going forward, uh, not likely, <laughs> but let's just say that we did, it would take us until late 2022, basically the end of 2022 to get back up to our previous peak of employment. So, you know, the hope that uh, after the initial shock wave of the pandemic set in and we thought, okay, we're gonna have a quick bounce back in terms of economic recovery, job creation is gonna come right back once we get things a little settled. Well, obviously it didn't happen that way. So I think the point is here is it's gonna be a long, uh, slow recovery for our economy. And you can start to see that on the right-hand side with our monthly job creations, right? Here's our initial drop of nearly 200,000 jobs we've had in those two months, March and April, and then the quick snap back, but we still fell back in those later months of the year and things started to slow down again. And this is in part due because, uh, that we had tighter restrictions to go back in place late in the year. Um, so that recovery trajectory slowed down. And, uh, you know, I think once vaccinations uh, work their way in and the cases continue to fall, our economic recovery can start to accelerate this year, like we were hoping it was going to the back half of last year. So again, that's, that's the hope. And I, I think that that's certainly realistic as, again, vaccinations go up and cases go down and we can start to unfold here a little bit. Uh, but you can see that it's it's going to be slow. It's going to be slower than what we initially expected uh, uh, mid last year. It goes without saying this has been very well documented that most of our job losses, uh, even after that initial bounce back in jobs uh, mid last summer, still are in that leisure and hospitality sector. You can see down 31% from where we were uh, this time last year. Um, and sorry, this should say December uh, 2020 here. 
Um, so it's it's really leisure and hospitality. Uh, that's where the main job losses have been. All the other super sectors you can see here remain relatively uh, flat is a bit of an overgeneralization or maybe a little bit of an overstatement. But you know, a lot of the super sectors have actually come back to, if not where they were a year ago, but pretty close. So we know that there have been job layoffs in other industries besides just restaurants and hospitality and tourism uh, and travel, for example. But uh, by and large, most of the super sectors in Denver remain relatively stable. You can see the natural resources and construction uh, that declines actually more on the commercial side and even some oil and gas uh, that are tied to that sector um, that, that have some influence in the Denver metro area. This is more heavily influenced up in Northern Colorado and Weld County in particular, uh, but it's not home building that's drawn that number down, that is for sure. Um, and then, you know, government at the end of the year, you know, they've started to have some layoffs as well and some contraction um, because the uh, sales tax revenue has certainly been impacted. Uh, their budgets are being compressed. Um, you know, so there's a little bit of uncertainty about how the government sector, especially our state and local government, um, uh, start to uh, kind of unwind from the, the economic damage that they're facing. And that's, that's not a short-term solution for sure. Uh, okay, so we all sort of know that um, because of, there's a couple of components here why our unemployment rate uh, has spiked back up. You can see on the left-hand side of your screen and then by county over here, and then kind of the, the previous year changes in unemployment rate by the, by the MSAs and then front range of Colorado and then all of Colorado. You can see we had a bit of a spike in December. Part of that is because of the restrictions that went in place. We had some additional layoffs took place, or some companies were running out of the original PPP loans that maybe sustained them in the early and later stages of the pandemic uh, last year started to run out. So we saw some layoffs uh, pick up, but also we know that these numbers, there's a little bit of skepticism about the validity of these numbers. If there is some unemployment um, claim fraud that's going on here that are uh, inflating these numbers a little bit, I suspect that the state will figure that out here pretty quickly and we'll get some revised numbers probably by next month in March where we can look back and say, okay, did the unemployment rate really shoot back up that quickly and that high? Um, but I think the point is here, uh, and we, we know that really the economic power that Denver Metro uh, had uh, leading into the pandemic, uh, but going back to that previous slide of our super sectors plus our unemployment rate, you know, that, that has fallen uh, to be relatively stable uh, prior to the December numbers, it just shows you the underlying strength of Denver's economy. It's a diverse economy, as we all know. We've got a lot of in migration into this market that continues today. Maybe it's not as much as it was a few years ago, but it's very steady and we've got a lot of people that want to live here. There's a, still a lot of companies that are moving to the Denver market across all sector types, as well as expanding in this market. So we're hearing of those that still continue throughout 2020, uh, even though there might have been an initial pause uh, in the spring, but um, I think a lot of those fears were um, um, uh, sort of aligned as the pandemic started to, uh, you know, again, kind of work its way through 2020 uh, and, and fear subsided about the strength of housing in particular. So anyway, uh, we'll get a little bit more clarity about the economic situation, particularly unemployment and layoffs, I think when the March numbers come out for January, um, and we'll see those revisions for December uh, move forward. Uh, a couple of bright spots. Um, the apartment market. So it, it's a bright spot in that um, we were basically at full occupancy for the apartment market, uh, just using rough numbers, you know, that roughly five to 6% occupancy or uh, uh, vacancy rate or so 95% occupancy rate is generally considered to be full for the apartment market. So we've been that way for, you know, the last seven, eight, nine years. And we've added a ton of apartments into this market. 
uh, uh, during this uh, most uh, recent economic and housing cycle that we're in. But you can see vacancies ticked up from where they were last year, 5.8% compared to 5.3% a year ago, and rent rates have leveled off. And this is really because uh, we pulled a lot of people out of apartments and put them into homes uh, because rates became so attractive. So the, the pandemic definitely accelerated that, um, but we're still at a relatively stable 5.8% vacancy rate. Uh, we think this actually is gonna go up even a little bit more uh, in the early stages of this year. We might get to the end of 2021 where we have a vacancy rate that's above 6%. Um, and stays there because we're still adding apartments in, plus at the same time, we're starting to pull people out of apartments. So if mortgage rates stay the way that they are and the economy stabilizes, I expect we're gonna continue to pull people out of apartments, um, which is really what we've been wanting to do. You know, a lot of the people that have moved to this state over the last decade, um, and most of them have been young, professional, single, you know, that's been a decade of, of that uh, demographic phenomenon that's happened here in Denver. And you know, this is the millennial uh, cohort that we've been talking about for over a decade. And, and now they're, you know, the oldest of which are in their mid thirties, they're starting families, their uh, careers are starting to accelerate. They no longer wanna live in apartments. Uh, so they're moving out and the home building industry is the beneficiary of that as we uh, had mentioned a few years ago that this was likely to happen. We're starting to see it happen now. So you can see the, the apartment deliveries have been accelerating year after year after year, took a little bit of a pause in 2019 and then jumped back up in 2020. So again, that's part of the reasons why vacancy rates went up a little bit, plus we're pulling more people out of apartments. So that's why we think the vacancy rate's gonna stay uh, where it is or go a little bit higher uh, this year. Uh, hey, Josh, uh, yep. we have a couple of questions for you. Sure. Uh, the first one is, do you have a better idea of the job growth or decline going forward in the oil and gas industry based on the moratoriums on new wells? Yeah, you know, we, we do keep track of the rig count, the active rig count in Northern Colorado, number of wells, uh, active wells, future wells, those wells that are being drilled currently. So oil production and natural gas production in Colorado we think the peak is behind us. Um, and again, that's our, our casual observation. We're certainly by no means experts, but um, you know, Colorado has been a top five producer for oil um, just because of the introduction of uh, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracking uh, that's taken place. But because of the new regulations that have entered into the market, um, it, it's just hard to imagine a scenario where production stays as high as it's been in the last several years. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's definitely an impact, but uh, it's still unknown, you know, whether the oil and gas industry stays in Colorado with, you know, it's billions of dollars of infrastructure that's in place or whether they take that infrastructure and that investment um, in this basin and then go elsewhere. Uh, whether that's you know to the Dakotas or to Wyoming or Texas or some other place, uh, or just further out into the rural areas uh, in Weld County in particular or Northeast Colorado, so it remains to be seen. But it, it's certainly probably not good for the industry that more regulations coming um, uh, from the industry's perspective. So kind of a uh, follow, follow on. On. go ahead. A follow on question to that, John, is. Um, how will Weld County be impacted going forward based on oil and gas? It seems that in a, it's an affordable market and if people are moving to Colorado for lifestyle that it might not be as impacted, but what are your thoughts? Well, um, yeah, we've said all along that, you know, Weld County is becoming a more diverse economic base or, or it's, in, it's, it's, it's seeing a more diverse economic base plus the influence of Denver continues to push up the North I-25 corridor. So there's definitely um, uh, more affordable housing options up there. Um, so, you know, oil and gas maybe won't be as heavily influenced on the housing side of Weld County as it has, let's say the last uh, couple of decades uh, for those two factors, just its economic base is diversifying plus more push out of Denver 
to find more affordable alternatives. So, you know, in the early stages of this, Weld County is just, uh, you know, the, and I'll show you here in a later slide, um, continues to see pretty substantial growth, despite the fact uh, that there's some unknowns of the oil and gas industry. That's all we have at this point, John. Okay, good, thank you. Um, all right, so um, the other bright shining star in all of this, and you know, it seems like we're talking about this quarter after quarter, year after year, but the resale market uh, set records for 2020, you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, 2020 sales volume for existing homes only, um, up 7%, so 62,500 transactions that we had last year. A staggering number considering um, that we went through a pandemic and we had all the job losses that we did in Denver and the economic uncertainty out there, uh, but it just shows you how much pent up demand still sits in the marketplace. Um, and again, the pandemic really accelerated that along with low interest rates. But I think what's really staggering about these numbers, when you look at the annual sales pace here in the gray is the level of inventory, which is in the blue. So we've had incredibly low inventory. We all know it for years in Denver, the last six, seven years, you know, we've been roughly two months or lower of existing home inventory. Well, now, um, for the total market, you know, we're like a half a month of supply of listings in the marketplace. And that was as of December. Um, and usually this goes through some seasonal fluctuations, but, you know, again, the pandemic accelerated this demand skyrocketed. Uh, but the number of listings that are out there actually went down at the same time, because I think there was a lot of hesitancy for people to put their homes on the market during the pandemic. And this is actually, I think, one of the really favorable opportunities for the home building industry. We've been talking about this for a little while. When you look at the total transactions in the marketplace, the resale in the gray, the new homes in the blue, and then the red dots are the percentage of new home transactions relative to all transactions in the market. So you can see prior to the Great Recession, each year we were around 25% of all transactions in Denver were new homes, so one in four. During the recession and then shortly after the Great Recession, it got down to about 10%. So uh, the resale market, much more affordable. There was a lot of listings out there, obviously. Um, and new home opportunities were sort of few and far between all the broken projects it took us years to unwind from. And then slowly we've been gaining that share back. But you can see in 2020 it fell. I mean, it fell in 2019 because we had a little bit of a pullback in the home building industry in 2019, if you remember. And then the resale market kept growing. Uh, but we think this is going to reverse itself here pretty quickly, in part because we just think it's highly unlikely that we'll do the same number of resale transactions this year as we did last year. 62,000 transactions. We have so limited uh, uh, listings in the marketplace. Seems highly unlikely. Um, and at the same time, we've got all these new projects that have come online for builders. Uh, the mind share of the buyers now shifting over to the new home side, maybe a little hesitant to buy somebody else's homes. Plus, there's not a lot of existing home inventory out there. Um, and builders are incorporating new products, um, more innovation in the home, uh, more design uh, elements that have been built into floor plans, uh, in part because of the pandemic. Some of the builders were already doing this, but let's say work from home space, workout space, you know, all builders have been redesigning their product uh, for that uh, um, sort of state more stay at home scenario. So the mind share of the buyer we think is gonna actually shift back over to the new home side and accelerate even more quickly than it has in the previous years. Um, so that's a really good opportunity for the home building industry. We've got a uh, pretty high ceiling out here to capture some of that demand out there. Um, so um, I'll end with the economic stuff before we get into the housing stuff with, um, we talk a lot about um, demographics. I mean, it's really kind of a numbers game here. It all comes back to demographics in my view. Um, sure, there are other factors driving household formations and growth, you know, the economy obviously is a major factor in that. 
But when we look at our total population in the Denver metro area, about 30% of our total population by 2025 is gonna be that millennial, roughly in their 20s to late 30s. Um, and this is uh, the biggest segment of our population. It's no secret. We've been talking about this for years, but again, they're finally here, right? They are buying homes. There are most, uh, uh, most of the homes that are sold in our market, whether it's resale homes or new homes today are the millennial cohort. They might not be the fastest growing as a percentage. So you can see kind of the older age groups here in the, this should be seventies, eighties and nineties. Um, you can see the older age groups are growing at a faster rate, so we're aging, but it's it's not as big of numbers, right? The actual raw numbers of people. It's really the millennials that make up the biggest bulk of our demographics today, um, and they're buying the most homes. So this is what's going to feed us, we think, for the next decade as families grow, as incomes start to peak. Uh, this is what's going to drive the housing industry in Colorado, particularly in Denver, for the next cycle that we're in, the next decade, or 15 or 20 years. So, you know, that combined with mindshare, the buyer kind of shifting over to the new home side because we see this perpetual low supply of existing home inventory going forward. It's demographics and it's mindshare of buyers moving over to the new home side. We think. Um, should cause the industry to be pretty optimistic about the long-term future of home building in Denver. All right, so let me pause there, John, if there's any other questions about the economy before we shift over to the, the home building side. I'm not seeing any at this time, John. Okay, well then let me pause to take a sip of water. <clears throat> okay, so, um, you guys may remember from the last time we got together, we talked about the incredible backlog that most of the home builders had uh, this time last year. So early 2020, you know, we were coming off a pretty amazing November and December for a lot of home builders. A lot of contracts were written. That backlog carried into the early stages of 2020. We had a big number of housing starts in the first quarter of the year. If I remember correctly, we were up like 33 or 34% in Denver for home starts in the first quarter of 2020. And then the wheels came off, obviously. Well, we're starting this year, 2021, with kind of the same level of backlog, right? We had a lot of homes built the back half of 2020. We had a lot of sales contracts in the third and fourth quarter, which I'll show you. And uh, our sales pace per subdivision, you can see in the top hand, right hand corner here, this is our weekly traffic and contract report, covers about 85% of the market. So it's a really good indicator of the initial demand in the marketplace. You can see we're actually outpacing what we did in early the first six weeks in um, 2020. Uh, so pretty incredible. So the backlog remains very healthy. So we're off to a pretty strong start in 2021. And I think there was some concern, like when we got to the end of 2020, okay, did we borrow a lot from the future uh, demand? Like people that maybe weren't gonna, you know, they probably weren't planning to buy a home in 2020. Maybe they're gonna push it out to 2021 or 2022. But when rates got so low and there was sort of this exuberance of getting into the marketplace, did we pull people forward? I think the early indication is that while some of that may have happened, we still have plenty of demand out there in the marketplace. Some of it's still pent up or some of it that's organic because we still have people moving into the market that need a house. And when they look around on the resale side, they can't find a thing. So our conversion rate as a result is as high as it's ever been uh, through the first uh, month and a half of the year. You can see that we're in that 10, 11% range, well above where we were in 2020. In 2020, it, at least in the you know, first couple months, we thought was shaping up to be one of the great years we've had in this 10, 11 year recovery. Um, so we're above that. Our cancellation rate, you can see is it's low as it's ever been. We've been doing this report for almost 20 years. We've never seen our cancellations rates as low as they are uh, this time of the year. So really strong indication that we're getting into the early stages, the very early stages of our spring selling season. We've got some momentum to carry forward into 2021. So that's some good signs. Um, 
And then uh, when we look at our project count, so this is our active project count, obviously attached in orange, detached in the blue. I know it's a little hard to decipher, but you can see where we peaked back here a, a couple of years ago, back in September in terms of our project count. And it's been difficult to maintain that same project count, but especially if you notice here's 2020, look how it started to go down in 2020. So demand picked up, we started selling through uh, active projects really quickly and couldn't get new stuff online uh, to keep that same pace. So as a result, the current active projects are probably gonna see their same store sales accelerate this year. Now there's a risk that we run through lots um, too quickly and some of the builders are measuring their lot releases and they're raising prices pretty dramatically in some cases. We're tracking all of that. We've seen some pretty staggering price increases um, in the early stages of this year already. Uh, and again, that's maybe put in place to sort of artificially kind of slow down that sales pace so we don't run through uh, a project's lots uh, too quickly. Uh, plus, we've got to measure costs. As we know, if you're tracking commodities prices, lumber has gone up, what, 34, 35% since the 1st of January. So if you wrote that contract in December, and then suddenly the lumber prices shoot up by 30 or 40%, um, you've got to eat those costs. So again, it's it's a way to kind of measure the the um, the uh, absorption pace by having scheduled deliveries for lots. John, is there another question? Yes, uh, we have a question. It seems that the industry was shifting from larger homes to smaller, more affordable footprints. But how do you think that millennials will impact that shift? Or are we going to back to larger homes given the pandemic? Yeah, it's a great question. One that we've been asking ourselves in our office. I have a slide that actually addresses that. Uh, that if you want to hold on to that question just for a few more slides, I'll get to that because we did see what we're calling a pandemic bounce in terms of livable square footage. Um, so we're starting to see some of the deed records come through now. So that absolutely did happen. Okay, so yeah, we'll done. address that here in a second. Um, all right. So uh, here's our starts and closings pace. So this is our, our quarterly lot survey that um, we're looking at aggregated here for the Denver eight county metro area, and we're including Elbert County in this count. Um, so you can see we've actually closed more homes than we've started the last two years. You know, it's been a long time since we've done that, um, obviously the early stages of the Great Recession. You know, so it's sort of counterintuitive that we would close more homes than we start. Um, in a market that's growing and an economy that's got a lot of momentum behind it. But that tells you just how constrained the industry is, whether it's lot supply, whether it's labor, whether it's costs. Um, but the pandemic, you know, uh, we still closed more homes than we started. So you can see that breakdown here by condos, townhomes, and detached. So there's our 11,426 starts, our 11,984 closings. So what this tells you is that even on the home building side, our housing inventory remains incredibly tight. Um, we don't have a lot of spec homes out there. Um, and then our attached product, you can see condos and townhomes um, represent about 30% of our total starts. So we did about 8,000 single family detached starts in 2020. So it was a 9% increase. And this is the biggest gain out of all of the product types was detached. And again, our organization thought that this would probably happen because we were introducing new communities over the last year or two, especially big master plan communities. And a lot of those communities, to the earlier question, John, were incorporating smaller lots, smaller footprint of the home, a more affordable price, generally speaking. And so we would we thought that that would kind of reignite the detached market that had been actually losing share of more attached product getting built, the townhomes and duplexes. You can see those have kind of leveled off for the year. Uh, so um, interesting dynamics that are happening. So let me circle back around to uh, comparing what's happened on the sales activity versus the starts. 
So it's kind of interesting. I would think it's intuitive to think about, but let's look at the numbers here. So this is just net sales of all new homes, of all product, um, each of the quarters over the last few years. So you can see in the third quarter, we had a 52% increase in sales. This is the initial bounce after the early stages of the pandemic, kind of when we you know, plug the hole, all demand kind of came to a screeching halt. Model homes were shut down, you know, temporarily. Um, there was some uncertainty about how we kind of unwound from that. And then it was released, right? And then the question was, when we took our finger out of that hole in the dam, is how much water was behind the dam? How much pent up demand was really out there? Well, you can see the back half of 2020, you know, 52% increase in the third quarter, 7% increase in, in um, net sales in the fourth quarter, just a huge run up the back half of the year. So that pushed us to a 15% increase in sales, uh, contracts written uh, for 2020. Well, uh, translate that over to housing starts. Well, we had all of these sales in the third and fourth quarter. Thus, we had a big jump in starts in the fourth quarter. You saw earlier, 24% increase in starts but only a 4% increase in starts annually. So we've got a lot more contracts out there than homes that have started. So thus that gives us another indication about the amount of backlog that's sitting out there, but also some potential risk for the builders when they've written a contract in you know, December or November or January, haven't started yet. Meanwhile, lumber prices shoot up. Um, so we could be entering into some risky territory for 2021 with um, profit erosion uh, for builders uh, trying to grapple with the um, uncertainty about some of the cost structures in place as they're writing contracts. But they're writing contracts, and as we know, builders you know sort of figure out the rest uh, along the way. The important thing is is they're writing contracts. Um, so anyway, it's interesting to look at the comparisons between contracts and starts. Um, if we just looked at the fourth quarter starts by county, uh, and this is somewhat of a generalization because this has been happening for a little while where the suburban ring counties have been growing at a faster pace. Obviously, they've got land availability, a lot of big master plan communities, but big numbers here in terms of year over year growth for the fourth quarter. Douglas County, Adams County, Arapahoe County, you know, big changes. Yes, Jefferson County is up 30%. Yes, Elbert County is up 155%, but on a much smaller basis. And then Boulder, Broomfield, Denver, more of our interior counties just don't have the land availability. So we anticipate we're going to see that market share in those counties continue to fluctuate but trend down. So perfect example of that is look at the city and county of Denver. There's their 1,200 starts that they did, 1,178 in 2020. Well, look what it was just two years ago, 2,500 starts in the city and county of Denver. Yeah, you know, I would throw out a, you know, a, uh, an estimate that we'll never get back to that same number of housing starts in the city and county of Denver again. You know, Central Park is basically in its last phases. Green Valley Ranch is essentially done. You know, the urban core, while there's plans for continued growth there and housing more residents in the coming decades, there's nothing in the immediate future that's going to deliver high rise condos this year or next year. So it's going to be a while. And what does come online, it's going to be fairly sporadic. Or, you know, the big growth that we saw in like the Sloan's Lake and Highlands neighborhoods, those have sort of played themselves out in terms of volume and activity. That will probably cycle again and it'll move on to another neighborhood uh, that will start to get picked over and scraped and rebuilt. Um, but we may not see the same level of volume that we saw in Sloan's Lake and in that North Denver area. Um, I think we at the peak a couple of years ago, we did almost 800 townhomes in that small area. It's hard to imagine that it happens at that same volume. So interesting what's happening in Denver, but, you know, Douglas County continues to just march forward and new communities continue to come online today. Same with Adams County, same with Arapahoe County. So this is the future of the Denver Metro in terms of volume. And a lot of these new communities have come online are trying to figure out how do we capture that young buyer that's been renting for the last five, 10 years 
now wanting to start a family, but they really don't want to sacrifice what drew them to the urban core in the first place. So let's deliver some communities that have some new components, some different land plans, some different attributes, some different amenities, the homes that look and feel a little bit different than they did years ago. Um, so, you know, builders are aware of this as well as developers to try to attract that young buyer out to the suburban ring. Um, uh, and that's that certainly has been accelerated during the pandemic as well. So pretty interesting to look at. This is kind of a messy graph, but I, I wanted to show you all of the 11 county front range counties, the percentage that they are back to their previous peak. So this starts back in 2010, kind of the bottom of the housing market coming out of the recession. The peak year for most of these counties was like 2005 or 2006. So you can see Weld County, Larimer County, and El Paso County in the red. So Weld is in the blue, Larimer is in the orange. Um, El Paso County is in the, did I say that, is in the red? Yeah. So all are at both El Paso County, El Paso County is about 75% back to its previous peak, Larimer 69, Weld County 78%. So it's interesting that those are kind of the bookends of the Denver metro area. And they are generally our most affordable submarkets as well. Um, uh, maybe Fort Collins doesn't fit that profile, but there's a lot of push up that North I-25 corridor and out of Boulder as well. Um, into Larimer County, into Weld County, and then south into Colorado Springs. So pretty interesting what's happening down there. They've seen bigger gains in activity year over year than the Denver Metro has. And you can see some of these counties like Jefferson County just peaked several years ago, just don't have the land availability to keep their market share up and have gone down. Same with Broomfield, same with Boulder, same with Denver. So those interior counties are going to continue to lose share. It's the suburban market that's really going to drive this market forward. Uh, and then pricing, uh, no surprise here, but really the, the meat of our market still continues to be that four hundred dollars to $600,000 price point. This is all product combined in this graph. So townhomes and a small number of condos that we're building have been integrated into this graph. And most of that attached products in that three hundred dollars to $400,000 price point. Uh, not all of it, but the majority of it, particularly the townhome and paired product that's kind of filling that, um, that uh, kind of great divide that the single family detached market left in that price point. So, you know, there's more market acceptance for more attached product. I think most of the builders are incorporating more attached product into their portfolio. Uh, and then if we go to the next slide, it'll show you the gains for the fourth quarter over the fourth quarter of 2019 by these price points. So the biggest gains, and this has been the case for the last several years, are again in that $400,000 to $600,000 price point. And that's kind of the meat of the Denver market. This is just detached that we're looking at here. So big gains in these higher price points. So this gets back to this earlier question, John, about livable square footage. You can see the new home pricing on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, there's the median in the purple, and then the average is in the blue. This is not a blended, annualized, or trailing 12-month average. It's taking each month. So you can see we're just under 600000 for that average sales price of new detached in the Denver metro area. But the fascinating thing here, this gets back to this question, over the previous few years, you can see these, these uh, blue or teal lines that represent the square footage on the deed record of everything that's closed for new homes, uh, detached, had been declining. Um, so I can't remember the percentage that we'd seen the decline. Um, oh yeah, actually I can. <laughs> Sometimes I forget when I add a little insert, uh, but from, 2016 to 2020, we had dropped about 7% in our livable square footage. And then we had a big bounce. You can see this, this um, really it started in March, April, of, really it was April or May of 2020. And we had a big um, spike in terms of that livable square footage. So some of that was just people wanted bigger homes, but some of that was also finishing basements. We saw a greater percentage of homes that were closed, finishing basements as well. And that was 
to incorporate that work from home space, to incorporate working out from home or more people cohabitating, kids coming back home, you know, whatever it was, people wanted more space. Um, so I think what's gonna happen here, and you can see it's already started to fall. Um, we think it's gonna get back to that original trajectory. Where we're gonna start to see the livable square footage go back to um, where we were pre-pandemic and then continue to shrink as we see more projects come online uh, with smaller homes. Uh, and then one of the more interesting uh, correlations between the existing home side, uh, which are in the blue, these are existing home sales, median sales for the previous 12 months, and then the new home side, which is the gray bars that you see, is uh, the relationship between the two. So you can see that the, the spread, and this is an annualized number, okay? So just taking the average over the previous 12 months is about $40,000, which is the lowest that it's ever been uh, at, from a percentage standpoint. It's only 8% delta between the new home side and the resale side. Well, why is this important? Uh, you can see this trajectory has been uh, doing this for the last decade as we came out of the recession when existing home prices, again, in the blue, were much lower, right? Roughly 35% lower than the new home side. So more people gravitating to the resale market. More homes there, it was much more affordable. You could get them quicker and move in quicker. Uh, well, as that delta narrows and that spread narrows to 8% where we are at today, it's a little bit of an overgeneralization, but let's just assume everything's equal, right? New home pricing and existing home pricing are equal. Well, back to my earlier point, well, why wouldn't somebody buy a new home if the prices are basically the same? Better technology in the home, better energy efficiency, new designs, new floor plans that can incorporate that work from home component, um, newer communities that are coming online. So, you know, again, I think we're going to see more people shift to the new home side for a variety of reasons, but one of which is uh, existing home prices have gone up at a much faster pace than new home prices, particularly during the pandemic. You can see where new home prices uh, here in the gray have kind of flattened out. And again, that's because we've been building smaller homes generally. So price per square foot's going up but generally the delta between the two continued to narrow. And that, that's only good for the new home building side. Uh, John, it looks like there was another question that popped up. Yes, we have another question here. It says, I realize you don't study the office market as in depth as the residential market, but what are your thoughts on office space in those suburban markets that will likely grow in the future given the lack of land in the interior counties? This question is based on the pandemic pushing people out to the urban corridors to suburbia as well, out of the urban corridors to suburbia as well. Yeah, and what happens with office space as a result? You yeah. Know, I don't know. It, my guess is probably as good as anybody's on this call. Um, you know, I, I, for one, I can only speak for myself. Uh, we, in our office, we have a small office, as you guys saw, only a dozen people that kind of came into the office every day. We haven't gone back to the office. I don't know if we ever will. Um, the term on our lease, coincidentally, ended in October uh, this past year, so we got some flexibility. We're just kind of going month to month. We don't need a lot of space, but it's kind of got us to ask, well, how much space do we need if we ultimately go back into the office? Um, do we have more flex space? Uh, do we just want meeting space and everybody else can work from home and kind of rotate uh, virtually? We were already a pretty flexible office and let people work from home virtually. Um, and I think a lot of the big organizations are having those same discussions. We know like the big tech firms have said that their staff that they let work from home during the pandemic, they've made a permanent shift to let their staff work from home. Because I think the original fear was, well, if people are home, you don't know what they're doing. Productivity is gonna fall when in fact, that's been proven now that productivity actually stayed high. And in some cases went up as we're always sort of at the office. Um, so I don't know, it, it'll be interesting. It definitely, um, 
doesn't necessarily tie people to have to be close to the employment centers, you know, which was so critical before in Denver. And we've got some big employment hubs. Downtown, of course, being our biggest, the tech center right behind it, the interlocking corridor, Denver West, out at the airport, at Simmons, you know, all those employment hubs. Maybe now it's not quite as critical, particularly for the tech center where so many of that employment base um, is in that professional and services sector that can work from home. You know, we're not considered that essential frontline workforce like, let's say, Fitzsimmons, where you have to be at the hospitals, for example. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see that how the dynamics of housing close to employment centers changes, but I, I don't, I can't predict what's going to happen with office space. Um, okay. So let's close up with um, just a quick look at inventory. Um, there's not much to say about inventory um, other than it's incredibly tight. So under construction inventory, you can see the red line, the months of supply is basically as low as it's been this time of the year or end of last year. Um, so, you know, the home building industry also has become pretty efficient over the last couple of years to get homes cycled through as quickly as possible. Plus labor constraints that were holding us back a few years ago have eased a little bit. Um, the pandemic certainly slowed us down in the early stages about getting people into the homes and getting things finished and getting your CO and all of that stuff. But you know, now I think we're figuring out how to navigate through that pretty well. Finished inventory on the right. Uh, see, these are completed homes, but nobody's moved in. in into that home at the time of our survey. So you can see how that finished and vacant inventory has dropped the last couple of years, just down 30% from the previous year. Months of supply, uh, like 0.7 months, uh, which is well below what we consider equilibrium in the market. So there's not a lot of excess new home inventory in this market. And then quick move in homes are just as low. So these are, um, info that we get directly from the builders about how many homes they have that are ready within, let's say 30 days or 60 days. So you can see that uh, you know, we're half of where we were with like the five year historical average and half of where we were just over a year ago. So quick move, move in inventory is also incredibly low, which is, this is more closely lined to like spec inventory, obviously that's out there. So um, that's no surprise. And then lot inventory remains very tight as you might expect. So even though lot deliveries are the highest since they've been in 2016 and up 5% over the year, you can see when compared to annual starts in the gray here that uh, they're basically staying in lockstep with one another. So what we start or what we deliver, we start a home on it pretty quickly. So it's almost like a just-in-time delivery for lots that we're into now. Um, so, you know, if we're going to, if we've been expecting some relief in terms of new lots coming on the market, we actually could go out and buy a finished lot. Uh, it's not going to happen. Um, our lot supply is going to remain incredibly tight. So uh, we're about 17 months supply of finished lots. You can see how low we've been the last handful of years. But when you start to segment that lot supply by lot size, uh, it's really the 50 foot lots in the yellow, 60 foot lots in the teal that make up the bulk of our single family detached production. Um, and both of those are at about a year supply of finished lots. So, you know, it doesn't get much tighter than that. The only one where we've really seen it go up in the last year are the less than 50 foot lots. So these are your 40 foot wide lots or 35 foot wide lots. You can see the bounce that we've had here um, in the number of finished lots for smaller homes. Um, and that months of supply has come up because these are new communities introducing new product, new lots. And we'll start to see that month supply come down as home starts pick up on those new communities. So lot supply remains very tight and I would expect that it's gonna remain just as tight all the way through this year and all the way into next year because uh, I just don't see a scenario where it changes much. Um, and then lastly, just to show you, I know there's a lot of numbers on this busy chart here, but just the top 25 master plan communities ranked by annual start, uh, which is this column here. So you can see Crystal Valley Ranch, actually for the first time that I can remember, is at the top of the list in terms of annual starts pace. Um, and 
if you look at the last 12 months sold that LTM number, so this is trailing 12 months. So basically all of 2020, if sales contracts written, uh, the number one master plan community was Sterling Ranch at a really average high average sales price as well. Um, you can see about $150,000 um, higher than Green Valley Ranch, which started more homes, but sold fewer homes. Um, so going forward. So if you can just kind of project forward, who's going to have more starts? Certainly in the first half of this year, it's going to be like Sterling Ranch. Uh, it's going to be the canyons. You can see their sales contract pace, you know, pushes them toward the top of the list as well, or Copper Leaf. Um, so, and then the other thing to kind of pay attention to is this finished and vacant inventory, you know, how thin it is, that months of supply of inventory. So what gets built gets absorbed really, really quickly as well. So, okay, so let's wrap up. Uh, we're going to hit the hour just about right. Um, you know, I talked about some of these challenges in front of us, you know, as I was going through the slide deck, um, you know, to me, and all of these are really, I think, um, they're sort of general challenges. We could probably add a list of 100 challenges that the home building industry is facing right now. Uh, the, the challenges are significant. There are some big hurdles out there and there's a lot of unknowns out there. And that may be the biggest challenge of all is just the economic uncertainty that's still out there and how the pandemic unfolds itself uh, over the next few months. But to me, it's kind of managing costs right now for the home builders and really interviewing a lot of the home builders, some of you on this call right now, about what's your concern for 2021. It's, it's costs, it's managing costs, you know, because, and, and as I mentioned earlier about those contracts that have been written, and then meanwhile, costs continue to fluctuate. Um, and what that does to your bottom line going through the year. So, Having said that, there's a lot that this industry has going for it. And you know, some of this is pretty general stuff that we touched on just briefly. Some of it's we've talked about in presentations in the past. Uh, there are some real positives in this Denver market. And Denver really, I consider it a top tier market now. It, you know, that might've been debatable by some in, in you know, the cycle in the past. But you know, we have now another publicly traded home builder here. We, so we have as many publicly traded home builders in this market as California does, as Arizona does, as Texas does. So it's on the radar of uh, what's happening nationally as one of the premier markets. Our uh, price appreciation is as strong as any market. Our in-migration and demographics are as positive as any market. The economic diversity in this market is really hard to duplicate. The one thing that other markets have over Denver is just the price of housing. And that's why Texas has really accelerated the way that it does, like Dallas and Houston are now our biggest housing markets. Uh, but we still have steady in migration. Um, again, it's not as substantial as it was in the past, but um, you know, more and more people continue to move into this market. And again, I think this is really beneficiary for the home building side because there's not a lot out there on the resale side for them to find. Um, so anyway, uh, there's a lot to be excited about, despite the fact that we're you know, still in the midst of this pandemic and economic uncertainty in front of us. So and many of you have seen me present these scenarios in the past. That's why we put these scenarios together. Um, and we're in the business of trying to forecast what happens out in front of us. And that gets really challenging in times like this. Um, uh, you should see and listen in on some of our conversations as a staff about what we think is going to happen in the year ahead, much less two or three or four or five years ahead. Um, so that's why we developed these scenarios. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but I will tell you that where we sit today with our health market, meaning positive cases declining, vaccinations growing, you know, our, our um, dial levels dropping back to more yellows and blues versus oranges and reds. That's happening. You know, vaccine, vaccines are working their way through the system. Restaurants are returning to at least 50% of capacity. Some of those restrictions may continue to lift. Large gatherings allowed the second half of the year. We'll see. That's the hope of everybody. You know, in-person school, that's a huge issue right now. Um, to me, that should be our top priority, get kids back into school. I know like a lot of you, I'm a parent of kids. My, mine are both in college, but they've been virtual this last year. It's been really hard on them. 
my wife is a kindergarten teacher. It's been incredibly hard on her, much less the parents. I can't even imagine the parents of a kindergartner that has to stay home. And what's that do to your productivity and your sanity? But I can tell you, uh, I'm married to an exceptional teacher. They want to get back to work. They are dying not seeing their kids every day. They just want everybody to be safe. So you know, hopefully that's happening. The economy, as I talked about, unemployment rate, yeah, it spiked, but we think it's going to fall back down again once they revise these numbers. And um, additional stimulus working its way into the system, the stock market's still going up, airline travel, 75% of normal by the end of this year. That seems unlikely because we're still less than 50% of normal for airline travel. Retail spending is obviously really high still, so that's good. And then housing, you know, if we kind of stay where we're at, you know, that's probably a success given the fact that we're still in the midst of a pandemic. So, you know, we're really kind of following along scenario run by and large. And scenario two, um, you know, is just taking all of that, but it's a little bit less. The numbers aren't as strong across the board. And there might be one or two of those that we're still kind of following into scenario two. And then scenario three is like worst case scenario. Uh, we're back to severe risk. We have another spike in cases. Vaccines aren't deployed as quickly as they are hoped to be. Uh, the stimulus package is stalled and, and nothing happens. Unemployment rate starts to go back up. Uh, the housing industry starts to stall. Um, home buyer confidence starts to stall. Uh, interest rates go back up. Uh, we start to have some notices of delinquency and foreclosures start to materialize, you know, things like that. We just, we haven't seen that yet. So if scenario one continues to play out, like we hope and think that it could this year, you know, we, we think we're still going to see a housing start market in the Denver metro area. I put zero just to hedge, but we're, uh, it's no longer a secret anymore, if I'm telling you, but we think we might see a 10% increase in housing start this year. Remember, we saw only a 4% increase last year. Uh, we had a 24% increase in housing starts in the fourth quarter, but remember the, the back half of the year for 2020, we saw a substantial spike in sales contract activity. We're going to start some homes that were sold last year. We're going to close a lot of those homes that were started at the end of last year this year plus our initial stages of our traffic and contract report that show that there's still some backlog out there there's still some pent-up demand out there that are above where we were this time last year so there's some positive momentum pushing us into 2020 again despite all this is the big disclaimer despite all the economic and health challenges that are still in front of us we think if all of this plays out under that scenario one uh, that allows me some wiggle room coming up with those scenarios. But 2022, let's say that things have started to calm down in 2022. We've got a little bit more clarity about where we're headed economically. The pandemic, you know, quote unquote, is behind us. I suspect we'll be living with the pandemic and COVID for years, maybe forever. Maybe we have to get a vaccination every year for COVID. I mean, that's what we're reading now. But let's just say that fears diminish. Um, more communities are coming online. So we see another repeat again of that five to 10% increase in housing starts in 2022. Um, is there more demand out there for housing? Yes, but we have some challenges and some constraints in place. And I think the thing to remember here is if we are 14,500 starts after two consecutive years of let's say five to 10% increase in starts, that would put us at around 14,500 starts. By the end of 2022, we're still only 75% of the way back to our previous peak in 2005. You know, something to think about, especially since we've added what roughly 500,000 people to our population in the last decade, and we're still only building about 75% of the homes that we built in the previous peak. Some of that has been absorbed by more apartments, of course, um, but it just gives you a sense of perspective and relativity. And again, I think more evidence that we've got a pretty high ceiling in front of us for more housing growth going forward. Okay, so I know I went a little bit long, John, um, but let me end there and see if there are other questions that popped up at the end or open it up to see if anybody else has any questions before we 
sign off for the day. Thanks, John. Um, I don't see any questions here, but as we close up here, I'll keep an eye on it. Um, thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, thanks to all our clients and team members who were able to attend today. Uh, hopefully enjoyed the discussion and uh, it sounds like we have another year or two of great uh, things ahead of us. So John, thanks for all your insight and uh, hopefully we will be able to uh, have this in person in August. If not, we will do it virtually again. And uh, then by next year, all hopes will will be back in person. So I don't see any questions popping up. So again, thank you all for attending. Have a great day and have a great rest of your week. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. You. you bet.